You're a highly creative, smart generation, and I think you are born into integrations. It's in your DNA, it's in the technology, it's in the way you think. I don't want to give anybody the impression they have to do it any one way. That's not the idea. You get it to fit for you. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Kondos. When our minds go through trauma, our bodies store some of that experience physically. That's why experiential therapies like psychodrama incorporate physical action. So how does Dr. Tion Dayton use role-playing to help people reach and release trauma that's buried under the surface. Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. I'm Dr. Tian Dayton and I'm a senior fellow at the Meadows. I came to the Meadows really because of my expertise in psychodrama. And I, I bring that into the, all of the Meadows programs. I'm a clinical psychologist creative arts therapist, oh. master's in educational psychology, and a, a trainer in psychodrama, sociometry and group psychotherapy. Oh, well, Dr. Dayton, so good to have you with us here at the U.S. Journal Training Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Always nice to be here. Yeah. So let's start with uh, introducing listeners to your story, yeah, your background. Um, I, know, I know you said you grew up around addiction. You had some of that, that experience in your childhood. What, what can you tell us about that? What brought me into the field was my father's addiction. It's something that, uh, you know, when my father, in my day, we didn't know much about addiction. So families fell apart routinely and uh, from not addressing it at any manageable stage. And we were so far down the road in dad's drinking alcohol that we, we couldn't come back. Mm-hmm. And our family became... It changed, it changed us forever. It changed us forever. And that's why really my passion, if you would call it that, uh, is to help uh, adult children of alcoholics because I think we are, a, we, I think we're a sick bunch. Mm-hmm. I think we really suffered. And we, what we suffered has, div- has come to have a name. It's trauma. It's relational trauma. Although we didn't know it at the time, but I have sort of spent my career trying to figure out how just living around addiction, we could mirror so so thoroughly the the drunken dynamics. Mm. Uh, I have come to the conclusion through understanding trauma that we mirror and play out what remains the most unconscious, mm. what hurt us the most, what traumatized us the most. We go unconscious with, we numb, we throw it out, we dissociate. We go away somehow. We defend against feeling what hurts too much. That's what what happens in trauma, in the mind-body. We shut down. Because you just can't handle it. You're just overwhelmed. So your thinking mind shuts down. Your limbic world wakes up. So you're pulling in all of the um, sensorial data of the situation. You're feeling a lot. You're, You're recording smells, sights, sounds, all of that kind of stuff. But you're not thinking about it. Consequently, you're not making the uh, sense out of the situation you're in. And without making sense out of it, you have no way to record it and pull it back up and remember it. You've never translated that into words, named it, right? I'm feeling thus and such. So your body just kind of put it, pushed it away, it didn't like process it? Or how, how would you describe you, it? You really process through the mind. You hmm. process through the, the prefrontal cortex, through the thought. And without that, you are left with the sensory imprint and the emotions, but they're not woven together into a coherent narrative. So they remain unconscious. And the way human beings work is we play out what's unconscious. In my own family, I I marveled at um, how do we act like dad at his drunkest? I mean, even our father would sober up and not act the way we act when Mm. we start to kind of implode. But because that was unconscious, because it was so painful to us as a system, like so many alcoholic families, we were once a happy family. We had something we lost. 
And, and that, but we didn't lose it overnight and we didn't lose it in a dignified way. We didn't lose it to death. No one came in with, you know, support black armbands Mm. and casseroles. We lost it a day at a time and we lost it in mortifying, embarrassing ways that we were in great denial about. So not only were we in pain, we were denying the pain we were in. And not only was our father becoming increasingly bizarre, we were denying what was happening right in front of our eyes. So that meant we got twisted. And then I I, uh, fast forward, got married, and my husband had a mirror image. His mother was that sick and alcoholic. So we we were a perfect couple in that we really understood the other. We were also a perfect couple in terms of triggering each other. And early on in our marriage, I, um, I remember just looking at him. We were having a fight and saying, you know, something's wrong with us. This isn't our fight. And this is before I understood transference and all that kind of stuff. But I knew we were yelling at the wrong people. Mm. And I found a copy of Vern Johnson's book, I'll Quit Tomorrow, on a shelf. And I read it twice without putting it down. And there was no such thing as ACOA recovery at the time, but I thought I need 12 steps because there's something wrong with me and it's related to addiction. And so I just sort of did my own little program and started to figure it out. Yeah, so that ACOA, Adult Children of Alcoholics, that's become, you know, much more of a, of a thing in the mainstream mm-hmm. now. But at the time, you were just figuring it out on your own, like you said. Just figuring yeah. it out on my own, yeah. treating myself in a sense. And I even actually, in the course of this, went to uh, an AA meeting thinking maybe I knew about Al-Anon. But for some reason, I, 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 uh, a friend of mine had suggested, Tiana, are you, because I was complaining about this and talking about how how weird I thought uh, uh, how our dynamics were. Mm. And she said, have you looked at your own drinking? And I was such a goody-goody, I thought, maybe I haven't, and maybe I should look at it. And this, I had had a glass of champagne on New Year's Eve, and I think our conversation was in April or something like that. I had nothing to drink in between. But I was so far out there think, you, worrying about, was I an alcoholic and that sort of thing, that I thought, well, maybe I should. So mm. I went to an AA meeting. And listen to all of these stories. And I remember then telling my story of a glass of champagne on New Year's Eve. And somebody very kindly turned to me and said, I think, I think you, you're not in the right program. <laughs> I think you should try an Al Anon meeting. Hmm. And I did. Which is for families? Family members. It's really was back then started for spouses. Hmm. So it wasn't a full click for an ACOA. But it was enough of a click for me. So, you know, honestly, initially when I started Al-Anon, I was telling the truth about my family. And no one jumped up, no one shouted at me, and no one left the room. And for the first year or two, that's all I needed. I needed to open up and talk about what was really happening Hmm. Or, or what had really happened. Just for you to, to release it, to, to go through that process of, of I guess. Co- connecting? I oh. guess so. Mm. I guess because I'd never talked about it. Mm. I never named it, never talked about it. And what would happen in the meetings, of course, I'd hear other people's stories and I'd think, oh, I identify with that. I identify, gosh, I had, you know. Suddenly my story was all over the room and I had things to say too. But saying them in my family had gotten me in so much trouble. Mm. I mean, the, the, the MO in my family was... You know, do it, but don't name it. Do it, but don't talk about it. You didn't get in trouble for doing something wrong in my family. You got in trouble for talking about it, mm-hmm. that somebody did it. And that got you in a lot of trouble. We killed the messenger. So I was from that mindset. And just being able to talk in al and have nobody tell me um, I was, you know, a troublemaker or what I said it was stupid or I was wrong was profoundly healing. Yeah. And then ACUA came along. Yeah, and so and so fast forward a little bit. You started in your professional career. You you studied psychology. Kind of what, why did you why did you decide to do that? What motivated you to to turn and, <clears throat> and help others? Because I needed so much help myself. Mm-hmm. I uh, you know once I found therapy and felt the the help it gave me, the relief it gave me, I thought. I need to be in this world all the time. And so then in my codependent brain, I thought, so I should be a therapist because then I can be in this world all the, all the time. Mm-hmm. 
And luckily, I figured that out early on. I figured out that I wasn't able to ask for help. I was just able to jump into the therapist role. But I understood that about myself so that, uh, because therapists can get stuck in that. Mm -hmm. And they try to meet their needs by helping others. And that's not a good thing. We have to meet our needs straight up. And then we can help others. Uh, but initially, I just thought, this is this is the world I belong in. Anyway, I get in there. Yeah. And then one of the things uh, within the, this world of treatment and healing that you become so well known for is psycho... Drama. Drama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could you just first first introduce us to kind of what that is for some, somebody yeah. who's never heard of it, not familiar? Psychodrama is a role-playing method. All role-playing you see anywhere in police stations, in businesses, you know, role-play a difficult customer, um, you know, in, in courtrooms, role-playing your uh, answers in court. Um, all of that is a derivative of psychodrama in one form or another. Mm. And I ran into experiential therapy through Sharon Wegscheider, who was a, an early mentor of mine. Uh, she trained me to do psychodrama, but we didn't call it psychodrama. We were calling it, she had been trained by Virginia Satir, who had actually been trained by psychodramatists, but the name didn't travel down with it. So I- uh, what, what was it called at the time? Experiential therapy. Oh, okay, yeah. Or Virginia Satir's model. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I discovered it was psychodrama because I got a flyer in the mail. I live in New York City. I had a flyer, and my husband pointed it out, and he said, this is psycho and drama. This is everything you do. Why don't they put the name together? Why don't you check it out? And I literally put it back in the pile of mail, and two months later, when it floated back up to the surface again, he said it again. He said, this is tomorrow uh, at the Roosevelt Hotel. Why don't you check it out? And my Children were small. They both had play dates, and I checked it out, and that's how I found psychodrama. Mm. And I went to the conference, and I was astounded at the method, properly done. It was a remarkably efficient, but not just efficient in healing, efficient in bringing spontaneity and creativity to the surface. It was a um, in the hands of someone who really understood the method, you could go anywhere. We focus a lot on healing past uh, trauma using psychodrama. And in fact, for grief and trauma, I don't think you can do much better than psychodrama. But you can also move into the future and do, you know, plan for scenes. Use it as a rehearsal of things you're, you're afraid to do. You can take psychodrama in any direction you like. Uh, and sociometry is part of uh, Jail Marino's triadic system. Uh, psychodrama, sociometry, group psychotherapy. Marino was a uh, father of uh, group psychotherapy. He started it. And sociometry is the sort of uh, uh, systems, you know, it's really the uh, the uh, psychodynamics of, of, psych of group therapy. Yeah, yeah. And so then, like you said, you, you wandered into this room and mm -hmm. you saw it being done mm -hmm. well, psychodrama. Mm -hmm. um, so what does, that, what does that look like? Like, you, I understand like the role playing at the police station or in the courtroom. In, in this context, what, what, what is doing well What did it, it look well like mean? for me yeah, what does it look that like? day? It, it, I had had a, I had had cancer. I was 35 years mm -hmm. old. I just had a radical hysterectomy. And I wouldn't, I wasn't talking about it a lot. I had two children. Life was busy. Suddenly I was in this room and they, the title of the workshop was Somatodramas. And I thought, I don't even know if I knew why I was going to it, but I, I think I did. So I went to it and the warm up was, was first of all, so funny that I thought this method is for me, this guy. I mean, Bob Soroka was doing that warm up. It was hilarious and brilliant and perfectly handled so that he had people playing their, their stiff necks and their sore stomachs and their, and all around the room, things were just popping in such a funny way. And people were saying the funniest things. So it seemed to bring out of everybody a sense of spontaneity and creativity. And then he, rather having warmed us up, he said, now, does anybody have something that really happened that, and I, of course, in my typical ACOA thought, oh, well, mine's not a very big deal. You know, I had just had a radical hysterectomy. I managed to turn that into no big deal. And then I heard other people bring their stories forward. And I thought, well, maybe mine's a little bit of a thing. So I brought mine forward. 
all these people chose me to be the protagonist. And that alone, that's how you do a choosing process. People say, I would work on this, I would work on this. And then you place their hand on the shoulder of the person whose work draws you. Mm-hmm. And several people placed their hand on my shoulder. And I felt so seen, just opening my mouth about it. And then I he had people playing you know, the part of my body that got cut out. He had somebody playing my father. He had, I mean, and the person playing my father was a woman who was wearing a pearl necklace and earrings and looked nothing like my father. But it, when I entered what we call the psychodramatic trance state, I thought I, w- I was sure I was talking to my father. And you also reverse roles and talk as your father back to yourself. So when you see role reversal, that is the sine qua non of psychodrama. It's profoundly important and experiential therapy should never be done without role reversal. You don't want to strengthen my role. Mm. You want to give me the opportunity to strengthen my role and create empathy by reversing roles and then experiencing yourself from the other or the role of the other. To understand the perspective. There's the attachment piece. Mm. Without that, it's not an attachment therapy. So when I was my father talking back to myself, my father by now had died, I could say the things I knew he would say. I could be the things I knew he would be, wanted to be. My father didn't want to fail me. My father loved me. So I could heal the parts of that attachment just by bringing it to life through role play in such a simple way. And then to experience it from all angles, not just human angles, But, you know, who could play the telephone that rang and terrified you? Who could, with that news that came to you? All kinds of possibilities through good psychodrama of embodiment. And then your conscious mind can start to make sense of what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for that description. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you've... I mean, you've taught this at NYU. Mm-hmm. You've, you, you're you currently the director of the New York Psychodrama Training Institute, mm-hmm. right? And so you've made this a, a big part of your life. What mm-hmm. what drew you to that? Why why did you focus on, on, on this part of the recovery puzzle? Uh, because it helped me so much. Mm-hmm. Because I thought it was the method for me. I, I had actually gone to an acting conservatory. So uh, at Cal, uh, Cal Arts in California, California Institute of the Arts, And I was trained as an actress and a really an experiencer, right? Mm. This was the uh, late. This was the seventies. We did everything. We were it's Esalen era, you know. We did everything very experientially. So I I knew this was my milieu, but I really wasn't interested in acting. It was too insecure a life. I loved directing. And I, I would have worked with children had I not done this. But when I found psychodrama, what I really loved about, about my acting training was how it helped people become more of who they were. Mm-hmm. It was such a way to, to become more. And by, by putting on a role, putting on a... Or doing anything that was dramatic. Hmm. Children do this naturally. That's where Marino got his ideas, watching the children play. Children take on roles. I have grandchildren. They're constantly taking right. on roles. Yeah. And this, then they reverse. Yeah. And they, you know, if they have authority issues, they, they play them out and they make their dolly their, you know, you don't do that again. And then, then they become their dolly and they talk back to themselves. This, uh-huh. this is how children. So, so it's an instinct that we it's have. It's an instinct. Hmm. It is an instinct. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And so what. Uh, to demonstrate. Right. Yeah. So, oh, to so, embody. So why does this, why does this work so well? Like what, why does, what does group. Psychotherapy, psychodrama, what, what does that offer that individual therapy uh, might not? Well, there are two questions here, I think, mm-hmm. maybe. One, why does it work with trauma resolution so well? Why mm-hmm. does it heal so well? And why does group therapy work, uh, I can't say better, differently, differently. from one, yeah. one yeah. to one? Uh, for starters, the body involvement allows what is in the limbic system to surface mm-hmm. through action. So that's how you were saying it was stored physically yes. and that action. It comes out through action. Okay. If you are asked to play, who could play your mother? And when you are in role, you suddenly say the things, they come out of you the way they do in real life, right? It comes out and then you reflect on it after it has come out. It's a more spontaneous way of figuring out what's going on inside of yourself. So this limbic world that has remained uh, silent suddenly finds action uh, in words. And uh, the group therapy aspect is very stimulating. They say it, it, the group becomes the family. The group 
uh, stimulates and triggers relationships. And they are often, or if you're stunted in your early relationships, it, they will recreate that. Yeah, yeah. And then and then it allows you to uh to have to listen also. It allows you to have to figure out how to be part of a group because if you're part of a dysfunctional family, you learn dysfunctional ways of being part of a group. You maybe learn to hide, you maybe learn to aggress, whatever you learned, it emerges in a group therapy situation. If the group therapy isn't overly formulaic, you know, a group therapist has to be willing to live in the moment. And to really allow stuff to surface in the moment. If you're too formulaic about it, you don't allow your people to to let that stuff surface. To, to let it go where it's going to go naturally, or or where it's going to get triggered and go or go unnaturally too. <laughs> but you need that to heal. You need it to come to the surface so you can see it. And so you're a senior fellow with the Meadows, uh, and you're, you've been involved with them for some time now. Uh, how how does this integrate with uh, addiction treatment, me- mental health treatment, uh, and you can even talk specifically about the Meadows uh, programs mm-hmm. uh, specifically? Uh, how do you bring psychodrama and, and all of this in, into a, a larger recovery plan? Well, for starters, it's already there. Um, so what I do in the addiction field and what I have done for the last 35 years is, is perfect what is already there. It, um, people were using experiential therapy just as I was coming into the field. And organically, everybody was falling in love with it. What's missing is to do it really thoughtfully and carefully and well, oftentimes, because people get a bit of training and then they, they go to town with it not fully knowing what they're doing. So I am there to train people well to teach them how to do this method responsibly and well. And beyond that, and that's just straight psychodrama training. Mm -hmm. Um, On my own, I have created an approach, a method, and I call it sociometrics. The model, overall model is RTR, relational trauma repair. But within that, I've created all of these discrete processes based on this theory of psychodrama. One problem with experiential therapy is it sometimes isn't based enough on on the theory. It's not informed enough. Uh, It doesn't understand what it's doing, really. Mm. It's too goal-oriented, too reductionistic. So my processes are more uh, open-ended, and they are also integrated with research. So what I can give uh, the Meadows is a way to work with grief experientially that allows the grief research to be, be made experiential. That, that is a group process that allows the body to be involved, that promotes people to have to interact with each other over and over and over again. But it is easier to do than psychodrama. You can integrate psychodrama into it, but it is easier to learn and execute, and it is also more focused. Psychodrama is not focused. It's a it's a method that can be applied to absolutely open-ended. anything. It's open-ended. So some people apply that better than others. But you can also go down a rabbit hole just following it where it's not useful in trauma resolution or in addiction treatment. So I've created these exercises that help it focus. Yeah. And that's the, the RTR, the sociometrics. Exactly. That focused version. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And that, and I know you mentioned you're doing some research with the Meadows as well. What, what, what can you tell us about that work? Well, we're really ready to make this an evidence-based. We've mm. been collecting evidence for a few years, but now we uh, have a program called Mending Heart Wounds, for example, that is, is a good one to collect evidence on because it's all sociometrics and psychodrama. And we can, uh, evidence is really just, I, I already know this works. I've already, I wouldn't even bring this out into the field unless I had already collected my own evidence. I, I spent 10 years, 15, developing it. I just need to put it on paper now. And we're doing that at the Meadows. Yeah. yeah. And so for someone else who who's working in this field or on the front lines of, of mental health, addiction treatment, how can they start to incorporate some of, some of this in the work they're doing? What, what, what are some ways that this can even be of more help to more people? Well, they can, you know, I've done a book called The Living Stage, which is sort of a, a Bible of, of uh, basic psychodrama and so, some sociometrics, about 100. 
And I have also a model called RTR, uh, Therapist Guide, Revised Edition, and that's on Amazon. So they can buy those and do that reading. On my website, tiondayton.com, there are films of these sociometrics, lots and lots of films. And there is, there's a network of psychodramatists that's international. So if you go on a website, ASGPP, American Society for Group Psychotherapy and Psychodrama, you can find a psychodramatist trainer in your area and get some training. And once you have some training under your belt or some experience, uh, you can start to use these sociometrics in your work. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Dayton, thank you for your time. We'll, we'll dive in even deeper on your new book, Soulful Journey of Recovery, in the next episode. But uh, before we break, what would you say is maybe the next step? What, what's another breakthrough, another challenge that you see looking into the future of you know integrating all this together? What, uh, what's the next step that you see in the next few years? For your generation to take over and for us to support you. Uh, my kids are in the, the younger generation who are now uh, moving into the power positions in the world. We got it this far, and we did a really credible job, I think. We worked hard to get these things to surface and be understood. You're a highly creative um smart generation. And I, I want to uh, acknowledge you. I think you are, you are born into integrations. We were, we learned methods and then we protect our methods. We're a more siloed generation. You uh, integrate naturally. It comes, it's in your DNA. It's in the technology. It's in the way you think. You are also already emotionally literate because we raised you. I mean, my kids, so it's just, it's been more of the language, been more it, in the mainstream. We did not talk about feelings when I was a child. That was an odd thing to do. We didn't do it. We didn't have a language for emotions. We were emotionally pretty illiterate. And we raised our children to be emotionally literate. You, you talk about feelings. If you go to any uh, New York City uh, coffee house, everybody's talking about their feelings. <laughs> you know, that's what everybody in your generation does. We talked about, you know, books. We talk, I mean, we didn't talk about our feelings. We do now as our age and our generation because we figured it out and we invented it in a sense and we talked, taught it to our kids. And so you already know that. And, but you're, you're good people to carry the ball from here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think yeah, integrations. Yeah. I think that's where we're going. Great. Integrations. You're not so siloed. You're not so closed. You're not so protective. Yeah. You know, you know how to how to put, pull things together, and that's what you believe in, and that's what I believe. And I design sociometrics to fit into anybody's system, anywhere, just to help you make things experiential. I don't want to give anybody the impression they have to do it any one way. That's not the idea. I get it to fit for you. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Dayton, thank Lovely. you so much. Thank you. Dr. Tian Dayton is a clinical psychologist who specializes in trauma, psychodrama, and adverse childhood experiences. She's now a senior fellow with the Meadows based in New York. Learn more about her work at tiondayton.com. Beyond Theory is produced and hosted by me, David Kondos. You can discover more from this podcast, including videos of each conversation, at beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening. And I hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Beyond Theory.